Welcome back to another edition of the Prepper Recon Podcast. Our mission is to bring you great interviews with preppers from around the world so you can be better informed and better prepared for everything from a hurricane to the end of the world as we know it. This episode is brought to you by CampingSurvival.com. Whether your plan is to bug out or bug in, CampingSurvival.com has all of your preparedness needs, including bug out bags, long-term storage food, water filters, gas masks, and first aid kits. Check them out online today at CampingSurvival.com. Be sure to enter coupon code PREPPERRECON for a 5% discount on your entire order. Today is our second Prepper Econ podcast. Every month we bring you an update from the world of economics. And our regular guest for Prepper Econ is Josh Collier of BeatTheEnd.com. Josh, thanks for coming back on the show. Thanks for having me again. Sure thing, man. So you got another giveaway going on over at BeatTheEnd.com. Yeah, we're giving away a uh, Gerber knife, a survival knife, and then a $25 Cabela's gift card. So come by and see if you can win it. Good, good. What do you got to do to sign up? Um, it's just basically if you like um, our site, on Facebook and uh, follow us on Twitter, do things like that. Good, good. Gerber's a good knife. I I got yeah. uh, I got one of those little Smith and Wesson knives for Christmas, which I thought, oh, this is going to be a nice knife because it's Smith and <laughs> Wesson, and that was at Christmas, and we're now in June, and uh, all the screws have already fallen out of it, and it's it's essentially just waiting to go in the trash can. <laughs> Bummer. Yeah, I, I've got a K bar. Um, little knife that I use as my uh, everyday carry knife, and I've been really happy with that. But uh, my dad actually used the Gerber for a long time, and he really liked that. So we thought we'd put a decent knife on there. Good, good. So maybe I'll get over there and try to win it. <laughs> there you go. So uh, Bernanke came out today and gave out the FOMC decision. They decided that they're going to start tapering QE3 as soon as the end of the year. Yep, and we'll we'll see if that happens. Yeah, yeah, but uh, it, it really sounded like he was putting out the warning. This is the second statement that he's he's made in that in that direction. But uh, you know, when he originally announced QE3, he said that he expected it to run through at least 2015. And at that time, the unemployment target was six percent. Uh, sounds like he's walking this back a little bit. Yeah, I think so. And um, I had an article here that was basically talking about how hard it might be for the U.S. to exit. Um, do a smooth exit on the QE, which um, Japan has not had very good luck with their QE system, so it may be um, beneficial to start pulling that. But we'll see what happens if they pull too fast, pull too slow. Yeah, well, already today, the uh, it could be turbulent. Today, the, the 10-year Treasury jumped 13 basis points right, right. after the news, so that was at 2 o'clock, and uh, it, it just... Just from two o'clock to close, it jumped thirteen basis points. That's almost a six percent increase in two hours of the ten. Yeah, that's measure. quite amazing. Yeah, so uh, the Dow went down a couple hundred points today. Of yeah, fifty-five percent. Just so. on the on the on the scare of possibly taking away the punch bowl. Yeah, definitely making yeah making more money. They it's, find a way out of that. But the rates could really start rocketing up from this point. So I guess if anybody's thinking about buying a house, we better be trying to yeah. lock in. Yeah, actually, we just um, locked in our rates today. Um, actually, I think it was yesterday when it came in. Um, we're buying a house, and we had one, had one picked out. only took us five offers, and we weren't offering terrible prices for the other homes. So so that market is starting to come back, um, the home market, at least in our area. Prices are going up, and there's quite a few people out there buying these. And they're low, lower-end houses, and that's where I'm at. Not the high end. Those are sitting on the market for a while. Just in the past two months or so, when we got pre-approved, the interest rates um, for us went up over a percentage, or right at. Actually, I think it was right at three quarters of a percentage. And then today, they said our realtor called us and made sure we were locked in because they were going up another quarter percent. So that's that's a one percent in two months. Two months, which is a pretty high high amount for interest rates. Yeah, well, that quarter of a percent that you just saved is probably probably a couple of thousand bucks over the life of the loan. So right, yeah, it's it's, it's a lot of money when when you think about it. whether it's ten bucks a, a month. It doesn't sound like that much, but over a thirty year loan, and you may refinance for a fifteen at some point. But um, over a thirty years, that's a lot of money. Even ten bucks 
five bucks. Yeah, well, I'm glad you could get in at that low rate and uh, take advantage of it before before they really start to shoot higher. I think that's a lot of why they started thinking about ratcheting back the QE. Is I think that they're seeing a rebound in, in the housing market, and right. I think they're understanding that inflation really could get out of hand if they if they don't start doing something about it. There's been some dissenters on the Fed board. Uh, Esther George has been warning of, of hyperinflationary events for a little while. She's the, the Kansas City Fed president. And yeah, once you have um, inflation go up and then you have interest rates go up and you have all these different things, that really starts the house of cards falling. He was talking about tapering off. So instead of the complete $85 billion per month of uh, bond buying and mortgage-backed security buying, that they would taper it down, I guess, maybe you know, a few billion here and a few billion there gradually. But as they start doing that, and it, the interest rates are going to start to, to go up, but I think that that's the only thing they can do to avoid the hyperinflation that they do see coming if they, they don't start tapering the easy money. Right. Yeah, that would be one of the worst things, the hyperinflation. It caused turmoil in many different countries, I think. Sure has, and it could take faith out of the dollar and eventually cause a complete currency collapse. You know, I, I even saw an interesting article today. I don't know if it would ever happen, but the Bitcoin, if it ever gets backed by anything, the Bitcoin, that could actually be terrible on the U.S. dollar because because the Chinese and the Russians and stuff could go around our of the U.S. dollar and use a Bitcoin. I don't know how realistic that is, but it was an interesting theory. Yeah, or, or some cryptocurrency. Right. Uh, okay. it, it may be it may be the, the currency of the future. Right. Of course, I'm not speculating in that market. No, me neither. <laughs> because right now, uh, with the NSA getting your emails and your phone calls and all your Google searches and recording everything that you do on Skype, which we record this show on Skype. So if you ever miss an episode, you can call up the NSA, and I'm sure they've got it on file. Yeah, they'll they'll have us on their most wanted list probably. Yeah, yeah, but they can they can quickly shut down all of the the Bitcoin exchanges. Mount Gox got hit by the government uh, last month, and and they shut them down temporarily. So that really that was a big blow to Bitcoin. So I guess if they're going to try to do it, they're going to have to do it outside of the reach of America. Yeah, and I think that would scare a lot of people just knowing that, that something like that could happen to actually invest in that. Where, whereas you invest in gold, you have it sitting, you can at least have it in your house and you have it there. It's not going to disappear unless I get someone steals it. Yeah, and don't write anybody any emails about it and don't talk about it on Skype and don't post about it on Facebook. And as long as the NSA doesn't know you have it, then maybe you'll be okay. But, uh, and then we got the, Bureau of Lies and Statistics jobs numbers two weeks ago. The unemployment number is back up to 7.6% uh, after Bernanke was today saying that everything's rosy and we probably don't need so much QE. Uh, yeah, but two weeks ago, unemployment was back up, actually. I guess he doesn't want to – they never want to say anything too bad to mess with, mess with the market. Um, so they kind of have to say everything's so great here. They have to sugar ever, sugarcoat everything they say. Definitely, because they could cause a colossal panic. They could they could actually trigger the collapse. Yeah, that's a, a scary place they're in. Yeah, but so two weeks ago we we found out that we added 175,000 jobs. Um, of course, we need 312,000 new jobs every month just to absorb new entries into the workforce. If we assume an average labor participation rate of 68 um, percent, I think that our current labor participation Patient rate is only 63%, which is very, very anemic, and uh, we could get by at about 189,000 to to maintain the 63%. But that's that's not healthy. So we're we're way under what we need to be producing. And the GDP went up a little bit, but like, but still not enough because of the QE program. Yeah, I think that the first quarter GDP for 2013 was 2.4%. Uh, we increased the money supply by 7%, which is just fake money that they pumped into the system that didn't exist before, which bought stuff, goods and services, so that counted as GDP. So that's an artificial stimulant to GDP. So if you take away that 7%, if you subtract that from the 2.4%, you get negative 4.6%. By anybody's definition, that would be 
a depression. So they they put in that certain amount. They know how much they're going to be putting in, and they have their expectations. The expectation for growth was actually 3%. Being that they're even lower than their expectations is not good, even though it is a gain, uh, kind of a gain, I guess. The actual GDP, but not the money supply. Back to, to jobs, the, the jobs that we did add there, like you, you were talking about last month on Prepper Econ, they're right. low-quality jobs. There are a lot of service industry jobs. There are a lot of restaurant bartender jobs. Yeah, those kind of jobs usually don't last. They're not your um, great jobs. And they can be semi-high paying, I guess, but uh, they're not like the jobs that we probably want to see in our economy as much. Um, we need some manufacturing jobs. Mm-hmm. Which I think manufacturing lost 8,000 jobs last month. We need to start uh, exporting some of our stuff, which we really don't export enough. Well, they're trying to devalue the dollar, so it's a good deal to buy for China or India or anybody else that wants to buy our stuff, but they just yeah. don't seem to want to buy it. They haven't started yet. No. They haven't started buying the Harley. No. But that's a total of 12 million people that are out of work right now. Yeah, and then right. another 8 million that are working part-time because they can't find full-time employment. So I guess this is what recovery feels like. We can tone down the QE and uh, everything's going to get back to normal. We've got the housing bubble back. We've got the stock market bubble back. We can just kind of forget about everything. I guess it's 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 great as long as you're not coming out of college with a, a big loan. Yeah, and that's, that's the scary thing with uh, my wife. I actually got out of college with no loan, but my wife didn't have as much help from parents off, which he did have a decent amount that we're, we're not struggling with it, but it's definitely a much higher percentage than I'd like. Uh, there is one of them that's at 10%, so we're trying to wow. try to uh, consolidate, refinance them, and, and we'll have to really look into that, but it doesn't seem that there's really great ways to do that. Maybe pick out a personal loan at a lower amount or something. Uh, it's too bad you couldn't have rolled it into that mortgage. Yeah, uh, we didn't think of that. That might have been a, a good idea to do. I don't know what the home that we're buying is going to appraise at. So. Yeah, I don't, I don't think they'll probably really let you do that. No, it would be nice. Sure. <laughs> but, 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 but this is another potential catastrophe is the, the student, student loan bubble. There's about a trillion dollars worth of uh, student loan debt out there right now. And, uh, and and student loan debt over the years hasn't really been bad debt or anything, but uh, right now with the unemployment, with people taking lower jobs and stuff, it's more difficult for them to pay off those student loans uh, because they're not making enough money. You come out of college with a $100,000 loan and you get a job at Wendy's, you're never going to pay that off. It'll take a long time. They can have them up to, I think some of those are 30-year loans, um, 20 year. So they're as long as a house. They're there till you pay them off. So right. you can't file bankruptcy on it. I guess you know that. Right, that's, that's true. I've, I've heard that. I'm not planning on doing that, but um, <laughs> right. it doesn't help to file bankruptcy even on those. Obama's doing his part to stimulate the economy. His new vacation to Africa is going to cost around $100 million. So he's stimulating Africa's economy, at least. And the government sector, because we're going to use our planes and we're going to position a aircraft carrier over there for him. I think we're going to airlift his fleet of limousines. So he's living it up just like a, a Saudi prince. Yeah, it seems real efficient with the economy. <laughs> austerity, austerity for everybody except Obama. I think, I think we're going to have some austerity coming. We've got about $16.9 trillion of debt. Okay. And 2012's GDP was 15.7 trillion, so that's about 108 percent debt to GDP ratio. Yeah, so I, I think we're going to have to make some cuts somewhere. I'm right. Sorry. I, at the moment, it doesn't look like it's coming down. It looks like it's just going to keep on going up, unless, like you said, unless they make some cuts or do something. Yeah, I know that. I know it won't be Obama or, or Sasha or or Michelle's vacations, but. Somebody's going to have to make some cuts. What do you think about Social Security? you think that that's going to be able to survive um, the coming austerity? Uh, not for long. <laughs> they keep saying it's, it's great. It'll last till 2025, which even at 2025, I think it was. Even if they're like, wow, we can do this great thing and we can get it at least till 2025. That's with them saying they have a $2.6 trillion Social Security trust fund, which that's what's supposed to be in it. It really doesn't look like that's what actually is in that because of all the IOUs to other different uh, 
uh, trust fund from different programs and stuff. They use a lot of that money instead of keeping it in the lockbox like it was supposed to be. It's a lockbox of uh, IOUs. And then uh, gold saw a big correction last month. I think the low is about 1330. Right now it's right around 1350, so still cheap. Nobody wants to buy gold when it's on sale. You buy, you buy dresses and shoes and everything else when they're on sale, but nobody buys gold when it's on sale. They like to pay for it when it's when it's high price. I guess they're waiting for a better sale. Yeah. Like Friday sale or something. Yeah. <laughs> now, James Turk was on the Kaiser Report last month, and he said that he believes it could be China that's manipulating the metals market. They've been huge buyers of gold over recent years. They purchased 800 tons of gold last year, and they've already purchased 300 tons just in the first quarter of 2013. So they love the low prices. So the, the way that they can, they can manipulate the market is that China can go in after hours, in the after hours trading, and sell small amounts of gold relative to the size of gold holdings that they have on the gold futures or, or physical markets and drive the price down quickly because there's not many buyers in there after hours. So as they take out each buyer uh, that will pay successively lower amounts, they can drive the, the overall market price down quickly in the middle of the night. Now, in the next morning, when the markets reopen, the price is suppressed. That suppressed price is the going rate, and now you've got a lot more people in the market uh, trading at that price so they can slowly regain the position that they sold off the night before plus add a little bit more at a discounted price without driving the market back up because there's so many more buyers and sellers during regular trading hours. And, and that's just kind of speculation of, of what he thinks could be happening in order for them to accumulate more gold. Yeah, but if that's happening, I mean, it's a genius idea what they can really do about it. I guess it's just kind of how the market works. Yeah. Now, back in the 60s, they had the London Gold Pool, which was organized by America to keep the dollar, to keep gold pegged at the around the $35 an ounce mark. And, and that's what they did. They would just buy and sell gold to keep the price manipulated. So there's some precedence for, for governments doing this, and, and it could very easily be the American government as well that just doesn't want to see the gold prices shooting up because it, it takes confidence away from the from the dollar. Right, yeah, people will start getting out of the dollar. And if, if they see it starting to, starting to go up, they'll get out of the dollar to buy some gold. But it's been done before, and there's there's nothing to keep it to stop it from being done again and and any any sovereign nation could could be doing it pork company in china shanghai international holdings put in a bid to buy smithfield hams last month but they're getting a stronger middle class and they want more meat and so looking to take ownership of uh american companies that actually produce something the ones that are that are left they're not buying Google and Facebook stock and stuff like that. They're buying things that actually produce something. Because you get those tech companies, they can go right into a bubble like they already did. But at least if you have something backing it with a trade, I guess trade secrets is a huge thing for making money. Yeah. Sure, sure. And they like that. They like learning anything they can learn from American companies about how to produce a product. And when you've got uh, 1.3 billion people all wanting meat, you know, hogs. Yep. Raising hogs is uh, that's that's a trade secret they'd love to have. And then uh, Peter Schiff was talking last month about the Chinese buying uh, residential rental real estate. Uh, Chinese hedge funds are going in and, and buying up big blocks of residential rent, real estate to to rent out and take cash flow from. Could be a little scary if you have all your homes are owned by the Chinese. All your meat. <laughs> And now everything's made in China. Well, it's not, yeah, and, it's and not just you, for Walmart anymore. Right. So the Chinese are not they're not and they're not buying our bonds anymore. They're getting rid of dollars as fast as they can. What they're doing is they're trading them in for real assets. They're trading in dollars for gold, rental real estate, and food manufacturing companies like Smithfield Hams. So it sounds like they're they're probably the smart money right now. Yeah, their their economy seems like they're doing a lot of things right. Who really would have thought that it would have been China coming up in the world, but uh, they must be doing something right in their economy. Yeah, and, and how did they do it? They do it by spending less than they make. The first step in building wealth is living below your means. 
you got to pay yourself first. You got to set aside some percentage of your income as savings every payday. Maybe start out at 5% and try to build it to 10%. Then learn how to live on what's left over. You got to cut coupons, drive an older car, live in a smaller house, do whatever you have to do to live on less than you make. If you just save what's left over, there will never be anything left over. It's really not that hard um, if you. Keep a budget. Know what you're gonna spend money on. Unless you're making like twelve thousand bucks a year, it's not that hard. Mm -hmm. And and I think that there's Chinese people making twelve thousand dollars a year, and I think that they're saving some portion of that. And yeah, in China, it's probably it is easier because the cost of living is a lot a lot lower. I guess in the U.S. It wouldn't be so easy. But, uh, but, but their standard of living is much lower. You know, they don't right. have to have the brand new iPhone. Yeah. They don't have to have the brand new car, and they don't. You know, they sac. They do things like they don't eat meat every day to sacrifice to so that they still have some money left over to save. Right. Yeah. Know. Just um, I think that's a, probably a big thing in their culture, which we have kind of lost in our culture. Yeah. Um, but with MasterCard visas, you just spend as much as you can, and then think about it later. Part and, and the government even pushing more more debt for people to get. That's a great, fine thing. And yeah, they're leading by example, aren't they? With seventeen trillion dollars in debt. Do what they uh, say, not what they do. Quite a bit. And I think the coming collapse will be largely economic. So having a financial head will mitigate how painful it is for each individual, and, and just having that little bit of extra cushion in savings uh, can get you through some really hard times. Plus. You know, if you take if you're living on 30% less than what you you make, or 20% less than what you make, and then you get a 10% uh, pay cut because your boss just can't pay you as much anymore, then then it's mitigated by that having a, a, a smaller lifestyle of spending less money. Yeah, and it was interesting when we um, went to get pre-approved for a loan a couple of months ago. We kind of told them how much money we wanted to spend, not what we could spend, what uh -huh. they felt we could spend. Right. So, um, that was a good thing. Basically, we took it at, I think it's close to 33% or so, how much we make for our home mortgage. Because she, she's like, you could go up more if you wanted to. And I was like, I don't think we could really afford it just looking at our the stuff we, we buy and everything. And she, I said, what what could we go up to if we really wanted to? How high? And she said 45%. Wow. I thought that was kind of ridiculous, especially because we have the student loan. Yeah. Uh, and I think the student loans are about 10% or something of what we make uh, a month, somewhere around that, um, not including tax. But uh, they're about 10%. So right there, it's 55%. So you'd be really having a tough time, I would think, because we're already a little scared, which most people are when they're going to buy a sure, house. Sure, absolutely, yeah. Like, how are we going to make it? I know we can because we actually do. We have budgeted it uh -huh. so we still be able to save money each month um, for things that always happen. Don't think you're going to. And and I don't really give financial advice, but I think gold and silver are a great hedge against inflation. I try to keep a small percentage of my assets in gold and silver, and uh, I always buy it from JM Bullion. They are a show sponsor, but uh, I've been using them since before they were a show sponsor, just because they have the lowest price over spot. And uh, for our listeners out there. If you want to buy anything from JM Bullion, you can use coupon code PR5 and get $5 off your order of $300 or more, which will cover about half the shipping cost, which is only 10 bucks. And, and we're working with them as well. So uh, Good company. Definitely a good company. And if, if China is the Asian picture of what to do with your money, I think Japan is probably the Asian picture of what not to do. Two months ago, Japan announced that they would be stepping up QE to a level that would double their money supply in two and a half years. Yeah, I, I don't see how that's going to be beneficial to them. Um, going to make their say their their stock market going to make that very volatile, and it already has. It has already. Uh huh. The the right after the announcement, the the month following, the Nikkei jumped thirty percent in a month. That's not healthy. That's just not good growth at all. And it's not, no, it's not because good. Japanese companies suddenly had better earnings. It's because people were trying to get out of the yen. They were buying anything they could before the yen goes to nothing. Right, yeah. It's a, all speculation there. And it, it's not like they're really gambling that much when they're telling you they're going to inflate their money. Right. So. And, then, and then in the past month, uh, the Nikkei has lost more than 20% or about two-thirds of the gains it made since the QE announcement. 
Right. It's very yeah. volatile behavior for any market. And yeah, that's not a good thing. That uh, raises speculation and can go out of out of control, and it already kind of happened. And that's something we have to keep our eyes on over the coming weeks. You know, the the Nikkei's had days in the in the past month where it lost 1,100 points one day, 700 points another day, 500 points one day. It's dropped from just below 16,000 to right around the $13,000 mark. Can you imagine if that was in the Dow? There'd be panic in the streets. People would be going nuts. Right. There'd be food riots and it'd be end of the world as we know it. Yeah, I mean, when ours did that, it was uh, much slower. It, it still went down about that much, but it was a much slower uh, decrease, too, and it was still causing problems. Right, right. But we could still have some volatility in the future. So, you know, I guess uh, the best thing to do is is do what you're doing. You, If you're buying your house, if you have a house, no matter what happens to the nominal value of that house, you own a place to live. That's, that's the main thing I wanted to And you've got – and if you've got something in the – even if you've got the smallest yard in the world, you can grow some portion of your own food. If you've got a roof, you can catch your own water. Yeah, there's so many things you can do to save uh, to save money and to be more independent. Um, one of the things we're looking at on the house, it doesn't have uh, gutters, so we're going to put gutters and a water catch system. And then uh, we're probably going to use a square or rectangle water uh, water system. It gets really cold here, so... I'm uh, looking at doing a, a solar, basically not a solar panels, but making a box with solar to heat the water tank to make sure it's not. Oh, those are ingenious, and that saves yeah. so much energy, and it's just it's free hot water basically, and it's That's just a right. box. It's just a box with a black inside, and you run some pipes to it, and position it to where it catches the sun, and uh, it'll heat your your water up. Hot enough to take a bath, or yeah, wash clothes, made- or whatever. We may do that. We may um, actually make it just kind of more insulated so it at least keeps it from freezing. Um, I was looking at um, heaters for those because mm-hmm. here you kind of need a heater in your water tank. They can raise your electric bills because they're basically just a, kind of like an oven almost or a stove, kind of like an electric stove almost. And so basically you just put it in there, it heats up and makes sure, make sure your water doesn't freeze at different temperatures. And those can really raise your uh, bills. Um, especially when it's really cold, being able to uh, at least keep the water so it doesn't freeze because your water is really not that usable as, as water storage if it's frozen. No, not at all. Not at all. But, uh, I mean, that's that's what we do. We just take steps every every day. You get up and you take one more step towards being a little bit more self-sufficient and, and, and living within your means and trying to squirrel away what you can and making sure you've got your, your food storage locked down and make sure you've got some means of defending yourself and do what you can every day. And, and, and that's that's being a prepper and that's being a survivor and that's getting ready for, for what's coming. Definitely. Definitely be prepared for anything that comes even if it doesn't come. Absolutely. So that, that wraps up this month's Prepper Econ economics update. Josh, thanks for coming back on the show. Now, where can the folks find you again? Tell them one more time. At BCN, and we're having a uh, nice giveaway right now. So, www.bcn.com. Thanks for having me, Mark. Absolutely. So, head on over there and sign up for that cool Gerber knife if I don't get it first. An economic storm is headed our way. The die has been cast. We must spread the word and prepare. The coming collapse will bring a contest between tyranny and freedom. If the patriot is to prevail, we must stand as one, pledge allegiance to our God, and defend the Constitution. If you are new to prepping or would like to learn more, read our 7-step survival plan. You can find it under categories on the left-hand side of our website. Thanks for listening to the Prepper Recon Podcast. God bless and happy prepping.